chat also at the same time. Okay, so uh, just also uh, put a plus um, if everything goes well. Um, good morning, everyone. So here are Jochen Wells from um, Valencia University, and now we will continue with the um, Artmo toolbox. Thanks a lot, Matthias and, and Katja, already for the introduction on, on mapping applications and also the Edmap toolbox, because with the Artmo toolbox, um, it's very um, overlapping and perhaps a little bit complementary here and there. So we have a little bit already an introduction and I will go fast forward to um, the presentation of um, today, if my screen is okay. Yes, so I will um, first give a very brief introduction on the rationale of the development of the Artmo toolbox. Then afterwards, we will uh, see the essentials of Artmo, basically how to run um, RTMs, um, um, how to um, see the output, um, do that for different sensor types. And then finally, I hope in the second part, we have time enough for the um, retrieval toolboxes, especially the machine learning toolbox. But if there is still time, I noticed there was interest also in the um, vegetation indices toolbox. Um, I also have to tell that uh, demo data is available on the link that was sent. And um, there you can also find the presentations. I will not uh, finish all presentations here on time because of lack of time. So uh, probably I will switch halfway towards the um, Artmo toolbox, go on from there, but you can follow the steps on the presentation. So. Okay, so just, just a quick uh, background, um, RTMs, uh, basically those are physical models that describe the interaction between radiation and vegetation, and eventually radiation is recorded by the, by the sensor. So it translates that into um, um, codes, and these codes we can use for all kinds of applications, such as development or evaluation of indices, mapping applications. We even use it for the development of satellite missions. Uh, what Katja already told, uh, there are all kinds of RTMs. Uh, they are, on one hand, uh, they can be uh, what we call cheap models or uh, very fast, simple models, but also very, they exist very complex models that describe reality with a high realism, but make them also difficult to use or are computationally expensive. Altogether, these RTMs, they consist of input variables that are, have a direct relationship with um, outputs such as reflectance or transmittance. And, um, Based on these relationships, we can also develop indirect relationships, but those are not what we call state variables. For instance, chlorophyll content has a direct um, absorbance, what we saw with Matthias before. And based on chlorophyll content, we can develop relationships, statistical ones, with, for instance, nitrogen content. So um, we have the state variables, and then we have variables of interest. I need to, okay. The, um, um, history of RTMs, however, is that there are all kinds of RTMs available, uh, starting from very simple ones that are just simple equations up to highly complex ray tracing models that show a um, very high realism. So it makes us a little bit uh, wondering or questioning what would be the right RTM to use. And um, also um, taking into account um, the, uh, the desired application. Having a look to leaf models, um, it was already introduced, the prospect models on the left side, very simple, just uh, a few variables. On the other hand, the ray tracing models describe very uh, realistically the um, structure and the absorbance of the leaf. The same for canopy models. Uh, we can think of very simple models where um, the canopy is just described as a function of um, leaves scattered in an, in an um, um, in the sphere, but also um, over the times more and more complex models have been developed with the high realism up to these computer models. This was more the trend until the uh, 2010, I must say, since 2010 onwards, thanks to uh, especially the work of uh, Christian van der Tol and, and the people around, is that no longer they try to be uh, super realistic, but rather they try to also introduce um, new um, models within to the RTMs, such as photosynthesis model, or um, temperature models or so on. So rather we also try to have a better understanding of uh, leaf physiology rather than just uh, structure. So this was a bit the time when I started with my work. There were several RTMs available, but they were not all public available. They were also not synchronized. They were written in different languages. So the problem was uh, which RTM to use, um, how to use them. 
um, it appeared also they were not um, GUIs available at that time. And if they were, they were just for some forward simulation, but not at all for mapping applications. So that made us um, deciding to work on a toolbox where we um, wanted to put them all together. So we developed a toolbox where multiple leaf and canopy RTMs are being put together in the intuitive interface. Uh, it should provide a comprehensive visualization of the outputs. It should work for any kind of optical data. And eventually it should work for um, mapping geophysical variables. Also, we find it very important that it should be able to um, deal with different land cover classes. At the end, an image such as Sentinel or so, not just consists of grassland, but typically it consists of different land covers, so that has a different structure. Maybe uh, agriculture fields we want to process with ProSale, but the forest we want to process with more a forest RTM. So this brought us to um, Artmo, um, automated radiative crossover model operator. So the RTMs is really the core of the um, software. And we um, pretend that it's plug and play, although the installment uh, takes a little bit of time. Uh, once you have it properly installed, um, you will see that very easily new tools or toolboxes can be added. Um, also, once you um, know working with one RTM, you can see all the RTMs work in the same way. So it should be um, supposed to be intuitive. We work very hard on it, that it's robust. Um, there are loads of bugs, but each version we keep on improving it. And by now we have a stable version, I would say so. And it's generic, meaning that it can work for any kind of um, optical data, so sensor data, um, um, whether it's airborne, spaceborne, or so you could load just your own data into it and, and do your processing. Okay. The, we decided to work um, and to develop Artmo into MATLAB, and that's maybe the only inconvenience that a MATLAB license is required. But it also has a historical reason because all the um, RTMs, or the large majority at least, have been developed in MATLAB. So it was the easy choice to um, um, work further on, on that in the MATLAB environment. Also, the images to process so far only um, should be in NV format or TIFF format, although we also work on um, NetCDF format. Once we started with these RTMs, uh, we felt like um, um, that is a great opportunity to further improve and expand the toolbox. And when we started with it in, back in 2010, what was very popular was the start of the, the apps. And, and we felt also we should uh, develop apps um, to, in order to bring together all kinds of methods and models and so on within the same toolbox. Um, far too much papers have been presented and published with the new methods, but at that time, no way the um, codes were easily available. Maybe now it hit its all, all public, but at that time we felt like, let's just try to bring um, not just RTMs together, but also all kind of um, matting methods such as neural network, support vector regression, classifiers, um, unmixing, BRDF apps, and so on. So this is how Artmo looks uh, like nowadays. Um, you can go to the website you need to register to, to download and um, afterwards I can help you with how to do the installment. But you can see it keeps on um, expanding. Um, every RTM that we get in our hands, we try to um, 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 include to it and um, um, basically um, the um, toolbox consists of the RTMs and also on retrieval toolboxes. Uh, we have the spectral indices toolbox where you can uh, evaluate all kind of indices. Uh, you can do inversion of your RTMs and the machine learning toolbox that will be uh, the second part of this of this tutorial. Also, we have all kind of uh, tools so uh, to resample your data um, from one sensor to another. Um, we have also this emulation tool. Uh, it was yesterday a little bit described. Basically, it does um, the same as a machine learning toolbox, but the other way around. While with machine learning, you want to um, retrieve um, variables of interest, such as LAI and so on, from your spectral data. With the emulation toolbox, you start with um, input variables, LAI, chlorophyll, all those from your RTM. And spectral data is the output. Why is it of interest? Because once you have that model developed, it's super fast to generate those kind of spectral outputs. And that can especially become relevant for advanced RTMs, such as DART, Motran, that take long time to do a simulation. So basically, you just need a few hundred simulations to train the emulation later, once you have it, you have afterwards a model that, pro that behaves exactly the same as the original um, advanced RTM. 
Finally, we also have a global sensitivity analysis toolbox that uh, gives you the uh, driving variables um, of each input variable from um, RTM. Here we see an example of prospect for variables. So we see in which wavelengths, which variable is of interest. Also, we started uh, with developing uh, plugins, and these are standalone softwares that can be added to Artmo, but also can uh, function um, standalone. So no MATLAB is, is required. One is the um, atmospheric um, lookup table generator, ALG, which consists of all the atmospheric models that we could find. So Motran, CXS, Libratran, and a few others. And then there is a time series toolbox that uh, Santi will uh, present later on this, this afternoon uh, for time series processing. So this is uh, the current status of Artmo. It keeps on expanding. Um, everyone also is invited to, to join, to contribute, to develop new uh, tools or toolboxes and so that all for the benefits of the community. Um, yeah, this is also how the website looks like where you can get more information of um, all the RTMs, um, the retrieval toolboxes. Um, once you register, you will have access to the download page and from there, uh, there is instructions how to, to install. You also need to install um, MySQL as the data is stored on this database underneath. Um, I, I can also help you further on with it. Uh, here are some um, guidelines. I, I will skip these slides for now and I will move to the um, start of um, explaining how um, Artmo works. So we have Artmo again and this is a little bit what we will see today. We will um, first um, define um, some leaf model, uh, some canopy model and we will run those, those, those um, RTMs and see the, the output. So special output as in, in, as in graphics, in the figure, or we can export it to, to a text file. So a little bit similar what, what Matthias was showing. Um, and you can see it just needs a few steps to go through this all. A few uh, the words on terminology. Um, so we have uh, one part of the toolbox is about project management uh, to define or change uh, your databases. Um, the data is stored within a um, um, data server, uh, MySQL, underneath. Um, then we have the retrieval toolboxes for mapping applications, tools for post-processing of your RTM data and the RTMs. Um, later we will see um, how the toolbox works. So just here a few uh, words on how it works internally. So data um, is generated by means of the RTMs and they are stored underneath into a uh, um, database, um, MySQL. Um, here, um, the credits go to uh, Specchio and Andreas. Um, um, I was inspired by, by, by his way of working. Um, we basically do the same, same approach. So everything that is done is stored within um, a database and you can change the database within database. Um, when you start doing with your simulations, you uh, first give it a name, we call it a project. And project can be something called like, for instance, Sentinel-2 or any kind of image. And within, within that project, you could also define different classes. For instance, uh, forest, you want to do simulations with a forest RTM, grassland with a grassland RTM. So uh, you can, um, in this way, hierarchically um, generate uh, multiple um, lookup table classes. And further, you will see, we can do that for the sensor you are interested in and so on. So um, this is a bit uh, the um, structure of it. Also, apart from the simulations, also uh, metadata um, is stored. So all the um, input variables that you did not touch, so you kept um, fixed, is also stored, just as well as information of um, how many bands, uh, the sensor, um, any kind of metadata that, that typically goes along with it. Uh, maybe also here I should mention, um, because we work in a very similar way as uh, Specchio and with Andy, we discussed this for for many years, if there's someone interested in doing an STSM together with us on making a linkage between Artmo and, and Specchio, uh, you are very welcome. <laughs> okay, so um, opening Artmo is very simple. You need to have MATLAB, but um, once installed, you just need to type Artmo and then the toolbox will open. I just first go through a few slides and then we go to the toolbox. The very first time you need to define a database. So you need to give, um, um, go to um, in file database administration new database. You do that just one time, so it creates all the space for storing the the data. And typically, in myself, I each time when I work on a new new paper or have a new Artmo version, I create a new database just to keep everything nicely um, organized. 
um, within file there are a few more other options so how to um, access your um, earlier stored data uh, change names delete um, um, those projects and so on also um, how to connect with, with mysql and uh, now comes the interesting part so the uh, leaf and canopy rtms uh, later we will see but i want to tell already that there are several ways how to define um, your simulations your your lookup table in the most simpler way you just click on ok and it runs this very simple single simulation same way as, as was matthias was showing but we also have all kind of options to uh, uh, generate uh, lookup tables um, it can be either by means of a step for instance uh, we want to make multiple simulations of chlorophyll content and uh, stepwise from a minimum to a maximum up with steps of five or or, or so on uh, maybe more interesting are the probability density function distributions where you um, give um, a range of um, samples. So let's say you want to do 100 samples, 1000 samples, and according to a PDF, normal distribution, exponential distribution or so. Or you can uh, just manually insert your inputs or in case that you have a measurements in the field, you can uh, load your text file with your measurements and then define what um, column is assigned to what variable and this way it will run only those um, inputs that you gave to to the, to the rtm that is once you know how it works for one model it works exactly the same for all of them um, so also in case of um, sale model so you have exactly the same structure and uh, in case of sale um, you can also load additional soil spectra we that was talked before so if you have your own soil spectra you can insert them and it will then do the simulations for all these soil spectra um, and just as well in case you are not interested into uh, leaf rtm but you have your own leaf reflectance and transmittance measurements you can also load it in so that you run sail alone without a leaf um, model finally once you have defined your your rtms um, you can run them and from here now i will move towards um, Arctmo itself and let's have a look at it how it works in practice so i will open matlab and all i do is i type Arctmo. and now it's, it's just quickly checking the uh, mysql connection it loads the um, apps and tools uh, the rtms and finally it says everything is fine and the toolbox is opened so um, what did we see before we had uh, in file where we have some um, uh, options to create a new project or to uh, load a project or rename but the first thing we need to do is we since as a new user is to create a new database so let's call it AO sense the name of the summer school and now it creates all the spaces inside for storing data okay and we can start with the uh, models. So um, since all the data is stored in a database, it's good to give a name. So in this case, I will start first with just the leaf model, uh, prospect four. And I will do only one variable, chlorophyll content. So we go to leaf. Here we see all the leaf models. Let's start just with the simplest one, prospect four, just four variables. And here we have these options to, to do the simulations. If I would just click on OK, it will do one single simulation. But actually, we are interested in doing um, multiple simulations that we can develop a lookup table. So I click on range. And in range, we have several options. So the easiest one, and that's what I will do now, is just stepwise. So we just need to give a minimum, a maximum, and a step. And if I click on OK, it will run later on those, those, um, those steps. We also have this option to do number of samples. And with that, um, we can give a probability density function. For instance, typically a normal distribution. We tell the mean, let's say uh, 40, standard deviation 20. And we say, OK, let's do 1,000 um, simulations. You can uh, uh, quickly inspect if it effectively has this normal distribution. And so like this. The data will be sampled chlorophyll content and then there was this third option uh, by user and then you just uh, give yourself the values you are interested in to, to simulate uh, for the first time we keep it with step and we select on okay so this one this variable now is activated and we can now 
combine those against other variables so that we in this way expand our lookup table it will do all the possible combinations if you want so i can do exactly the same for water thickness dry matter or the structural variable but to keep it simple i will just click on ok and um, only this um, rtm is now defined now i can go to the next step in forward so to run these rtms and we see the prospect 4 is activated Later on, when you try other models, you can see the other models also get activated. In this way, you can combine any possible leaf RTM with any possible canopy RTM. So let's go to prospect four. And what we see here, um, we select, we defined 16 uh, simulations. This is very few, but when you start combining rapidly, um, you can do millions of simulations. So we have the options to create a random subset from it. And if I click on OK, it will start running. There are also a few more options we will see uh, later on. We could decide to, um, from all the variables that we defined, to um, just take fully random with it together, taking into account the probability density function and taking into account the defined minimum and maximum of each variable. So in this way, you can fill up the parameter space. The same is done with Latin hypercube sampling, which does exactly the same, but in a more systematic way, so that um, the parameter space is um, systematically filled in the um, um, normal um, uniform distribution, sorry. Uh, further, one-to-one uh, -one simulations, in case that you have loaded uh, your own um, input variables for a leaf model, and then also afterwards your own for the canopy model, with this option, it will make sure it will just do these own combinations that, that you defined. Let's start simple and we just do these uh, steps, this graded way of simulating. And now the simulations were done. You don't see anything yet because they have been stored within the uh, database. But now if we go to tools, uh, graphics, we can have access to um, our simulations. To do so, you click on select project and here we see the metadata of all these simulations that have been done so far the project we this was our project with prospect 4 uh, the date uh, no sensor was applied so it's 2101 bands we did only one lookup table class only 16 simulations um, if you wish you can also have a look to the um, fixed variables so the variables that we are not ranged you can see we only ranged chlorophyll content and all the others were kept fixed Okay, we are happy with this and this is what we will load. So we um, do a query into MySQL and that the data can come into this, this tool. Uh, further, uh, for each um, RTM, they have several kinds of outputs. In this case, only um, reflectance, uh, transmittance. And we recently also added the um, absorptance, which is basically one minus reflectance and transmittance. So the parts that is being absorbed, so we can all plot that, but let's just keep reflectance. Uh, we, uh, we have options to, because it's all stored in MySQL, to um, query just a subset of all your data. But now I did so few, I will not do. And um, visualize your um, outputs as a function of an input variable. So in this case, the colors of your output will change as a vision, as a function of colorful content. We can add multiple groups of simulations to the same figure. So in case that you want to compare one RTM, the spectral outputs against the other one within the same figure, uh, you could now load another project and add it to this panel below um, that finally will be visualized. So if I click on plots now, it should uh, give me this 16 um, simulations. And we can see that uh, chlorophyll content only has influence in the uh, visible part of the spectrum. Um, the more chlorophyll, the more your spectrum absorbs, so the lower your, your spectrum. So this was the very first step. Now we go to file again, we make a new project, and now let's do it a little bit more complex. Uh, again, I st stay with a very simple model, but this time let's start combining two variables. So I go again to prospect four. I will start ranging uh, chlorophyll content again. But this time I will do as a number of samples and I will just do it in the most simplest way. I just take a minimum, a maximum. I keep that for now. And I do exactly the same for water thickness, for instance. So number of samples. 
Okay, so only two clicks, these are defined. Basically, I just defined the minimum and maximum boundaries. I'm fine with it. I go to forward again. Yeah, I see only four, but now I will change and we will do a Latin hypercube sampling, so a systematic sampling between these uh, two variables. And let's say we do 100 simulations, and now it will run 100 simulations between the minimum and maximum boundaries that we gave. We can go again to tools, graphics. Um, it's again stored within our database. We select the data. We select again reflectance, and let's plot it as a function of water content and chlorophyll content, add, plot. And now we see very nicely the impact of water content in the uh, near and the swir. And we already knew there was impact of um, chlorophyll content in the visible. So you can uh, just do all your own kind of simulations. And maybe let's have a closer look to the other models. Prospect 4, we already saw. And we can see if we go to prospect 5, it, it's exactly the same. It just has a few more um, input variables. It also has carotenoids and brown pigments. Um, in prospect D also has anthocyanins. And uh, lately now, Prospect Pro, I think Katja described it a little bit, also has protein content and carbon-based constituents. So this is the latest uh, model from the Prospect family. And perhaps uh, for our community here, even more interesting, are the uh, FluSpec models uh, designed by, developed by the group of, of Christian. So we have FluSpec B, and we have also FluSpec B, C, X. They are basically the same, but just with some more variables added. FluSpec models are same as the uh, leaf optical models, but they also include uh, photosynthesis, and, and this way, uh, fluorescence output. Uh, for that reason, it's not just optical properties, but also information about the weather is required. So the incoming radiation, um, the CO2 concentration, temperature, and so on. So we have the leaf optical models, which is exactly the same as prospect. And then we also have the a biochemistry model added that defines how um, fluorescence output um, is generated. So you can um, change the or define the fluorescence quantum yield, the maximum carboxylation capacity, um, whether it's a C3 or so C4 plant, and a few more options. And again, you can start um, ranging and combining in exactly the same way as we earlier saw with uh, prospects. So um, you can um, come up with any kind of simulations that you like. And I think the only difference with uh, FluSpect BCX is that the leaf optical model makes use of prospect uh, D. So there's also these um, um, Xanthophils, yes, xanthophil cycle and anthocyanins uh, have been added. A so new, uh, few more pigments have been added. Of course, we do not work only with leaf RTMs because at the end we are interested in using these kind of simulations for uh, mapping applications. So we need to upscale to the um, canopy scale. And how we do so? I will first create again a new project, and let's start with the simplest pro sale approach. We already have defined our leaf model, so I will not uh, touch it. I go now immediately to the canopy model. And here we can do exactly the same. So let's give LAI a range, maybe from zero to eight. And to be fast, uh, just uh, define the minimum and the maximum. That's it. All the other variables for now I keep uh, fixed. I click on OK. Now we forward. Um, Okay, so I still need to define prospect. I thought it was still there. So let me quickly define prospect. Now in forward, we have sale, and we see we have the combination of prospect with sale. And you can see you can combine sale with prospect four or five or any kind of prospect model or other models that, that, that are available. So let's go for this combination. And again, I will uh, quickly um, um, sample that parameter piece of only chlorophyll and, and LAI. Let's do 100 simulations. It goes very fast also. And we can have a look at it. So I go now again to um, tools, graphics. I select my project, my 100 simulations. And now we have the option just to visualize the prospect variables um, output. 
but also the sale outputs. And that's perhaps more interesting. So it's, um, in this case, sale only provides uh, canopy outputs and sale has a directional reflectance, hemispherical reflectance. Um, for some sale version that we have, you also can have fractional vegetation cover and a few more outputs. But directional reflectance, that's of interest because that's what the sensor observe. Again, we can make subsets, but let's um, just select all the data and we show it as a function of LAI and chlorophyll content. So we add this data to plot and we visualize it. So this is our more how we observe um, spectra in the field. And uh, with the broad range as a function of LAI, you see the large influence of LAI in the, in the uh, uh, near end sphere. And maybe here we can immediately see why is it why LAI retrieval is so successful? Because it's rather easy. You see how large LAI is changing the spectrum. It's, it has by far the most influence of, on the reflectance. So structural variables such as LAI or leaf angle distribution, they are relatively easy to retrieve, to make maps. Pigments, however, are much more difficult because, well, it's also influenced by LAI and it's only in a very uh, more narrow range. So, so that's for us the challenge, how to develop and optimize our retrieval models so that also pigments can be um, retrieved. Um, Matthias was already showing some um, um, methods on how to do so. Later, I will show a few more. And um, perhaps you are also interested in um, exporting this data. Uh, this is simply by click on export selected. Uh, we select an output folder. Uh, you can change the name and then we um, it, it um, exports it to a text file. Let me quickly have a look at it. Two files are created. On one hand, the output file with all the data. And on the other hand, the metadata. And metadata just says the, uh, what kind of RTM, date, uh, sensor, bands, and how the data is organized. So the first line uh, from, um, from column three onwards is the wavelength. Uh, color, column one is chlorophyll content, column two LAI, and then afterwards uh, the directional reflectance. So in this case here starts the wavelength and these are the reflectances for these um, chlorophyll and LAI combinations. Okay, um, so far so good, but so far we did just do simulations uh, with the full spectral range more of interest for us is to make use of these simulations for our own sensor settings. So we um, rather want to have simulations for a specific sensor. Uh, so let's start again a new project. And we, um, we already have several sensors inbuilt in the toolbox. So we can just for instance, select Sentinel-2 and then um, exactly the same what we did before um, is done, but for the Sentinel-2 uh, band settings. So if I go to forward and hopefully it's still activated exactly. So I can do exactly the same as what I did before, but now for Sentinel-2 and we can see then the differences between once what, what it is the full spectral data available such as with imaging spectrometers or uh, what is it with um, uh, spectral data when you have only broadband sensors such as Sentinel-2. So we go again to graphics, we select our data. Here we see it has only 13 bands. And we again select our reflectance data. So just for comparison, this is how a sensor from space sees it. And this is how you see it with an imaging spectrometer. So if I select just the data what I had before, and plot and here we are so you can see that uh, if this window wants to go down <laughs> you can see that the um, spectral data from the full spectral range provides so much more information about the absorbances and of water content dry matter and so on than just the uh, sentinel-2 image with the sentinel-2 um, spectral data, it's very hard to um, retrieve pigments or uh, water content or so on, because you can see the absorbances are missing that we have available with the full spectral range. Good. Now let's, um, so we have these sensors, so you can, we, these are just the standard sensors, the satellites that are or were available from space. But most of us, we also work with airborne data and we want to define our own sensor. And this we do so with the sensor tool. If I go to sensor, 
Here we see how all the sensors are defined, just with um, the central um, center, so we have maximum uh, signal to noise ratio if that's available. And we can switch some of them. They even work with, a, they have the option of the spectral response function. So I can actually show it, which means that it's more precise for doing the resampling. Um, the problem with spectral response function is that these are, they, they change over time. It has to do with the, the quality of the hardware. So um, ASA, for instance, each year they produce a new file with the new spectral response function. So you have to load that again in, in order if you want to be um, up to date and make use of it. For vegetation applications with, with, with broadband, typically just the full width half maximum is, is good enough to do a resampling. So you will see that in fact, most of the sensors here included, they don't have the spectral filter, they just have the full to half maximum. So what we want to do, we are interested in creating a sensor of our own airborne data. Um, it can be an Apex or HiMap or Prisma, whatever. There are several options to do so. Maybe the, um, what I find the easiest way is just to import an NV header file. And this we will do so. We have here, for instance, um, HiMap data available. So you just load the header file. It recognizes all the bands. We give it a name. And then it will um, write, I was trying it before. It has 25 bands. And then the um, data, these sensor settings are also stored into MySQL. So you have it always available. I can close Artmo, open it again. And you will see that the sensor has been added to the list of sensors. So we could make now simulations. Um, I will end for ex what we did before, just for the um, high map sensor. And so, so we have it in this case. Other ways to um, change or edit um, sensor are you could um, just be insert a text file. So perhaps you have created it in, in Excel or so, your own band settings. So you just need to, um, and this window will appear. You just need to give some basic information. I believe um, the uh, center and the band width, the full width half maximum is enough. It will automatically calculate the mean and the max. So um, you can this way define your own sensor. And also you can um, edit uh, existing sensors. Imagine that we want to remove some bands because they were noisy. So you just select a few bands and I can now click on, on the leads or you can um, edit. Uh, imagine that the um, wavelengths have changed uh, the bands um, sent position. So you can edit it here and um, you even have options to resample it to another sensor or so on. Um, so it's very convenient and easy to change your, your sensor band settings. I think finally you can also do it completely manually by clicking on add and you say, okay, I create a sensor of 10 bands and you just fill it in. You give it a name, you fill it in and you have your, your new sensor created. Oh, I was blocking this meanwhile. Okay, so here we did exactly the same simulations for HiMap in this case. So we can again quickly look at it. We select, these are our 125 high maps. And maybe it's of interest because even though it's only only 125 bands, we can already see um, so much more information than uh, as compared to, to Sentinel tools. So actually we can see already very nicely the absorption features in, in these 125 bands. So uh, sensors such as Prisma or, or Apex or um, Nmap, they have by far enough bands for, for vegetation applications. We can identify the absorption functions. Good. Um, these were the uh, basic um, leaf models we've seen, canopy models. So we have sail on one hand, the most common one. We also have um, inform. We have the, the authors here, I believe so, at least uh, Martin Slerf and Clement Asberger developed this. And Inform is already more interested for more heterogeneous canopies such as forest because also it defines, well, it's, it's a forest model. So it defines a stem density, tree height, um, crown diameter. So you can do exactly, again, the same. So you can uh, range for instance, tree height and combine with any kind of leaf model. 
We also have a more advanced model, but I do not recommend to use it uh, because it takes way too long time. Flight a ray tracing model um, where um, a whole scene is internally generated by means of ray tracing. Um, and finally, uh, reflectance is generated, but it takes awfully long time because for each wavelength, the scene has to be generated, uh, the reflectance to a sensor has to be calculated, and one single simulation already takes, takes several minutes, so it doesn't make sense for generating like large lookup tables. Um, with uh, the work of, of Christian, and, and this became more and more a trend, uh, first we had SLC, but um, then came SCOPE. More and more combined models are being uh, developed. And um, so where actually everything is, is included. So this is the SCOPE model in, in Artmo. And just as FLUSPECT, which is basically the first part, then also the canopy part is added to it. So we have again the weather conditions, the leaf uh, variables. We have then the uh, biochemistry. Uh, for biochemistry, I believe there are three different models um, um, included. So this is the simplest one, um, but also more advanced uh, biochemistry models um, you can have access to. Uh, soil parameters. There was a discussion about soil, if I if I remember. So uh, InScope has some variables on how to vary uh, soil with, um, you can play with soil moisture and soil resistance for evaporation. And you have a few more um, um, parameters that, that you can modify. So, so that already has some, some soil information included. Then the canopy, which is same as sail essentially, and the geometry. So again, you can combine everything with everything and this way make your, your, your simulations. I will not do so because uh, scope takes some time and I'm already running out of time. So I would say this was the um, um, forward simulation part of Artmo. And uh, now we will move towards the uh, machine learning part. I had prepared a presentation, but I'm running out of time. So I think I will, um, you can have a look to the presentation yourself and I will go immediately to the toolbox, um, which is in retrieval. We have several toolboxes available. So the spectral indices, if, if people are interested um, um, and they want to see it during lunchtime, I can also show it. I think it's a nice alternative as what um, Matthias or, or uh, had been shown because we are able to um, you, you make any kind of combinations for any kind of indices. So not just fixed bands, but actually it evaluates all possible bands against all possible bands according to an equation. So for instance, an in, in DVDI or so. Okay, I will, I will show it um, and during, well, afterwards. But let's first go to the machine learning toolbox. And, um, all our toolboxes, you need to go through a few steps. They are very logical and um, it's actually very easy. You always start with input where you load in your data. Then afterwards, you go to settings where you define your algorithms. And maybe you want to do some optimization. Maybe you want to apply dimensionality reduction such as PCA, or you want to do cross validation. That will all be possible here. Once you have defined your settings, um, you go to validation where you give um, a name, it will run all the models and also it stores all the models into MySQL. So you have all the time always access to the models that you have generated. If you are, it will give you um, the performances of all the models and then you can choose one, typically the best performing one for mapping applications. So let's go to it, we go to input. Input we have two ways um, and, and Katja talked already about it. So we have on one hand the um, 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 hybrid approach where we uh, can load our RTMs, our lookup tables that we have just generated. So again, here is the same select project as we had in graphics. We have the same overview of our simulations. So I could take these 100 simulations, um, take them. So I want to have that, that canopy scale because I want to run them for satellite. And um, these are the variables that I want to retrieve, chlorophyll content, I'm sorry, I need to move to canopy scale, yes. And I want to retrieve leaf error index and chlorophyll content. So now I imported them and we can go to settings and we can generate the models for, the, for that data. Um, but I'm more interested in uh, doing it with uh, user data because that's what most people have. They have their own data and want to generate a machine learning model of it. So I just quickly close and open it again. And we go again to input and we go for, to user data. Here, um, um, a window appears on how to load the data. And we have our, our data, demo, uh, of data demo data available. 
Um, so I have it prepared for a few sensors for um, CRIS, which is an old hyperspectral satellite sensor, HIMAP was our airborne sensor, and uh, Sentinel-2. Uh, maybe um, I will start with CRIS because it's not too big and still it's hyperspectral, so we can see a lot of things with it. You need to select your um, a text file where you have your measurements in. And um, well, within the presentation, you can see how we like to have our data organized, but I can explain um, here. Um, first, um, in the first window that, that we just saw, it just shows the data, so you can have a quick look at how it's the right one or not. You need to click on OK so that MATLAB checks if it's in matrix format and there are no um, empty um, cells within or so on. Um, if it appears in this right panel, it says that uh, for MATLAB it is OK. And how is it organized? Basically, we have, well, these are just the sample numbers, but we have our variables. In this case, is a Clarifel content. The next one is um, LEI in this case. Here we also have, in this case, fractional vegetation cover and a few more variables that were measured in the field um, here in Spain um, almost 20 years ago already during um, ASA's uh, Spark campaigns. And underneath we have uh, the spectra. And these spectra can come either from field spectrometer or if you have the GPS coordinates, just from the pixel from the image itself. Uh, so we have in this case about 137 um, uh, samples. Right. We also added some base soil samples and base soil means so no LAI, no chlorophyll, no vegetation. So just zero values in order that our model is also strong enough for um, interpreting base soil um, um, surfaces. So we have about 108 uh, points with um, vegetation variables and then some base soil. Good. What, how we uh, load in the data, you just have to say, okay, line number um, two in this case is leaf chlorophyll content. So I say line number two. You can add the units if you like, and you add that to, to what you want to use for further processing. Then line number three is leaf area index in this case. So also I give the right units. So I also add that. Uh, very important also to tell from where the spectral data starts. So from line number seven in this case, and then I could click on import, but I want to show uh, a few tools so we can have a quick look to the um, 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 to the Martin is uh, <laughs> sending me something to the spectra. Uh, sorry, Martin, I have no time now to, to read it. <laughs> Maybe we can discuss later, I guess. Uh, so, so this was the spectra that has been collected. So in this case, uh, Chris spectra, right? Another quick tool, uh, you can have rapidly the statistics of your uh, variables. So in this case, this was chlorophyll content and gives you the, the mean, the max mean standard deviation. So you can quickly inspect your, your available data. We are happy with it. Uh, we, so we can click on import. Also for um, more um, regular users, you could save these settings and load so that you don't have to repeat what I just did. So but here I click just on import. Right, we have the data imported. Now we can go to settings and here comes the, the fun part, I would say, because now we can start playing with all the available algorithms. And we have um, implemented over 22 different regression algorithms. Uh, most of them are those uh, machine learning algorithms, a few classical ones, the linear regression, uh, principal component regression, basically it does a PCA plus linear regression partial least square regression, very uh, popular among our community. What it does, it just, uh, it does a PLS uh, dimensionality reduction plus linear regression. So we can select um, these models. I will um, select the classical ones, that is uh, hemometrics, and a few that I know are powerful, kernel rich regression, and that are fast because uh, we, we are running out of time. Also, I add Gaussian processes, and I think for this is enough for now. And we have to say how much of the data we use for training and remaining data is then left for um, uh, testing. So we split in this case in 70%, 30%. Um, later, I will show you some more options, but this, let's do this for the first time. So the settings are again defined. Now it's also activated to green. I go to validation. I need to give a name. Um, so we have Chris, we did, yeah, I like to do it systematic and we did uh, machine learning algorithms and 70, 30. Good, if I click now on okay, it will start evaluating all these um, algorithms. 
um, these should be are supposed to be fast and then these uh, results appear I will just clean up this here okay and let's have a look to the results so um, for both Clarifel content and LAI these um, um, models have been trained and validated. Here we see for Clarfield content, we can also see it for LAI. And all the results are stored in MySQL. Basically, it just uh, generates um, queries the output. We can sort our outputs as a function of a statistic. It was by default uh, by uh, normalized root mean square error, but you could be more interested in R squared. You can resort it, nothing changes in this case. And um, it so this shows the top performing one on top uh, as here as a function of R squared. Um, you see Gaussian processes is very powerful, and then uh, kernel rich is another machine learning. And below are those uh, hemo metrics such as PLSR, PCR, and linear regression as the poorest performing one. This seems to make sense to me. And um, good, so we are we see the results, and let's have a closer inspection to um, how the model is behaving. We can select on plots and then all kind of options are available to inspect the performances. The first one, most obvious, measured versus estimated. Uh, this gives me um, the validation data um, against, uh, so measured against what is estimated and it follows nicely along the one-to-one -one line. Um, you can then also uh, have a look to the residuals. Basically it shows the same, just the differences um, as compared to zero. Gaussian processes has a few very neat um, additional properties. Uh, one of them is that it gives the relevance of the bands. So it shows what are the important bands in developing the model and what are the um, useless bands. And this is done by means of providing the um, standard deviation of um, over um, each band. And so the larger the standard deviation, the more variability, the less important it is. The smaller the, um, the sigma, the more important uh, that uh, those bands are. We can have a quick look and we can see that for uh, this is leaf area index. So for leaf area index, there are um, very important bands located all along the spectral range until here we had only until 1000. But altogether, because it's uh, logarithmically scaled, um, actually they all are very low, all the values. Um, so the whole range appears to be important for, for LAI. How is it for uh, chlorophyll content? So we can do exactly the same. And we can see here already some more differences. And here, this is something actually interesting because earlier we saw with the RTMs that chlorophyll content only absorbs in the visible until the um, red edge, so until here more or less. Yet still some bands appear to be very important in the development of this model. So that kind of contradicts against um, um, what the RTMs does. Now, how can we explain that? Of course, when you measure in the field, you never measure just variability of chlorophyll content. You measure variability of all kinds of factors. So first of all, when you, when you want to measure um, chlorophyll content, they need to be leaves. So there is a certain leaf area index. The more leaves means also um, the more um, the surface is, is covered, so less influence of, of soil. So, so all these uh, variables, so leaf area index, fractional vegetation content, um, chlorophyll content, when you start firing with them, in, in practice, in reality, they are somehow related. So that's why also these bands, they appear to be of influence for the development towards chlorophyll content, not because of chlorophyll absorbance, but perhaps uh, because of um, the amount of leaves available in, on, on your surface. Good. And um, do we have any, we have some, later on you can have look yourself to more options. We are happy with these results and we want to map them. How do we map? We select a model. Uh, let's um, select um, Gaussian process for chlorophyll content and you can select another model for um, LAI. So let's select these two models. We can click on done. And we can go now to the uh, next step to retrieval. Um, retrieval, we can do that for mapping applications. We always have the option that you process the fill image or you can also develop models per land cover type, what we said earlier. If you have a land cover um, class available that can be loaded here, uh, you can uh, have one model for grassland, another model for forest and so on. But now let's just um, um, uh, map the full image. And also you have an option for processing text files. So meaning if you have a field spectrometer data or so on, uh, you can use the same machine learning 
algorithms to process your field spectral, uh, spectral data into LAI and chlorophyll content. Okay, we select, um, in this window, we see the models that have been selected, but also in case you are not interested in validation, you can move immediately to this step, select your algorithm and just run it on, on your model. So without the validation step, but I would recommend always to do validation to make sure that your model is valid. And we um, you have a few more options um, in case that uh, you need to convert one image to, to another or so on. But here, um, since our training data came from the image itself, it's all in the same units. So I can just select um, my image, my Chris image in this case. And the next window here, it's the output. So I could say at, um, I would say something, um, we did two variables and it processes it. Uh, so once, but since we did two variables, now first the first um, variable was mapped and then the second one. In case we did only one variable, the map would immediately appear, but because we did two variables, I just have to select one of two of them. And we see um, to output, we have the LAI using Gaussian processes or Clarifel content. Let's have a look to LAI and let's um, this window appear. Now we can visualize the map. So we click on, oh, sorry, this I did already. Um, we click on view. Oh, I have to repeat it. LAI. Okay, view. Let me clean up this first. Ah, it doesn't want. Okay, so we have um, the map of leaf area index. It's a Spanish region here. And what is of interest uh, with uh, housing in process is that we also have a few additional information, um, what was already mentioned before, um, uncertainties. We can map absolute uncertainties. So that would be this map. And we can also map relative uncertainties expressed as percentage. That would be this map. Okay. First, let's have a look to, to our LAI and the absolute uncertainties. We see a very nice map. Uh, these are irrigated areas, so with high um, LAI values over um, the agricultural fields and very low one over um, its Spain summer over um, the dry um, senescent or fallow lands. Perhaps more interesting is to have a look to the uh, standard deviation, to the uncertainties. And there we see some spots with a very high um, uncertainties. Now, in, in class, I typically ask, so can people explain me why there are these high uncertainties? But um, probably uh, here there's no, no time for that, so I will immediately um, um, explain what happened. Basically, the models are trained with, with training data, and um, with the training data came from what was measured in the fields, and it was measured only over vegetated areas. So we can see in the uncertainties map that uh, vegetated areas have a very low uncertainties, Meanwhile, those spots of uh, bare soil that was not added to the training data set, um, they show super bright. So it basically says that here I have some um, estimates, but they are not reliable at all. Maybe more of interest is then to calculate the um, relative uncertainties, which are the uncertainties divided by the estimates and expressed as a percentage. And here we can see that effectively the low uncertainties are those uh, vegetated areas. Uh, meanwhile, the high uncertainties are those uh, base soil and all these regions that we not, did not really sample, so the model was not really prepared for it. And this gives us um, some interesting options because we could then generate maps with a certain certainty so that we are sure that the um, mapping was properly done by introducing a mask based on these uncertainties. And this we can do as follows. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, yes. Um, so we. Um, Apparently, I have to reload it because I was too fast. So, okay. So, we go to mask and we want to um, mask out all the uh, pixels that are beyond a certain uncertainty, in this case, 40% or so. Okay, so we can um, activate the mask. And this seems to be the most relevant map to me because here we have estimates 
only valid within the uncertainty of uh, less than 40% in this case. And you can see again, these are all the vegetated areas because that was after all how our model was trained. Um, I see I'm running out of time, guys. Do you want me to continue? Then maybe put a plus. Uh, otherwise, um, um, we take a break. So there's, okay, cool, because there's much more that I want to show you uh, from this machine learning toolbox. Um, let's go back to, um, uh, what shall we do? Yeah, let's go back to um, settings. Okay, some people ask for Sentinel-2. Um, yeah, there is uh, one more thing I want to show first with hyperspectral data, because I think it's important. And, um, right, uh, so let, let's stay a little bit with this Gaussian process alone, because that was um, top performing, right? Uh, the problem with hyperspectral data often is this uh, problem of um, band collinearity, so that we have, have too many bands actually for um, making making the model very heavy and um, um, suboptimal performing. So um, um, what is always uh, recommended is to combine it with dimensionality reduction. And that's an option you find here. And we have all kind of, oh, sorry, we have all kind of um, dimensionality reduction methods available. Most common one is a PCA. So you can just select PCA by clicking on it and select uh, the number of components you are interested in. Um, so we had originally 62 bands, maybe, um, yeah, let's keep with five PCA to be fast, but we have several more options of dimensionality reduction. PLS, what is typically in PL PLS R, so you could also combine this um, PLS and all these um, dimensionality reductions, you can combine them with your own machine learning models. So let's select a few more. And uh, minimum noise fraction is also a popular one. So these are the common ones. And we also have the uh, kernelized version of these dimensionality reduction methods, which means that, um, so dimensionality reduction methods do transformations into a lower dimensional space. So far, all these methods, they do uh, linear transformations. When you do the kernelized version of it, it can do nonlinear transformations, making it more flexible, but um, also much more um, options or tuning, so to say, is required. So it's a little bit difficult job how to make it more optimal than just the linear transformations. So let's keep it um, simple for now and just use these dimensionality reduction methods. Okay, another thing, that I want to show you is, um, it's in data tools, is cross-validation. Because very often we don't have so many data points for doing the training and testing of our machine learning algorithm. So we rather want to use all our data for training as well for testing. And this is done by means of cross-validation. And what does it mean? It means that you make subsets and you uh, divide in this way your data for um, the part for it of training and remaining part for testing. The most uh, commonly used is a k-fold uh, cross-validation method. And if I would take three subsets, it means that first it takes uh, the first two subsets for training, test it on the third one, then it takes the other two, test it on the other one, and then finally the other two, test it on the other one, so that all the data eventually has been used for um, training and testing. So let's, let's do that. So now we are combining two different techniques. On one hand, uh, dimensionality reduction, and on the other hand, um, cross-validation. By clicking on this cross-validation, no longer um, the um, training testing appears because at the end, all data is used. So I click on done again, and let's go back to the toolbox, validation. And um, you can give a name, but to be fast, you can also just click on okay, and automatically a name will be given. What is done now, um, we analyze several variables, LEI chlorophyll content. We analyze several dimensionality reduction methods. And then we do uh, the training in this 3K subset. So that's why now loads of models appeared. But finally, um, our results appear. Oh, sorry. And these R squares are supposed to be a little bit more reliable as what we did before. Because now, if I click on measured versus estimated uh, for chlorophyll content, all the data is included in the validation. Maybe uh, nicer is LAI. So, I click on plot and we see all the data that we had uh, that is being used for the validation. But also we can have a closer look to this um, dimensionality reduction and it appeared that PLS was the most powerful together with Gaussian processes. 
um, and we know already from PLSR, it's very powerful with linear regression, but it's even more powerful if you use uh, machine learning instead of the classical PLSR. I, I could compare this with PLSR and you would see uh, with, with machine learning, so nonlinear um, transformations uh, lead to better performances than just PLSR. Um, but this was the top performance ones, and I can also show the performances of the other methods. So second one is PCA. PCA and PLS, they are very closely related. Actually, you'll see the difference is not that much. And then there were a few others that, that were not, not so well performing. So we can, I think I tried five, so we can see the performances of all the different dimensionality reduction methods for LAI and also for clarifical content. Again, um, we can plot the options and let's go again to the sigmas. And now we see before we had 62 bands and now we see only five bands. And what happened here? Well, I guess you all already realized we don't uh, no longer use the original bands. No, because we first apply the dimensionality reduction. So the PCA and then we train the model with the components. So we see the performances of the relevance of the five components that were used for this, this model. Okay, and so now I could go again to map, map it and so on. But let's go to some other data. It was already proposed to um, use uh, Sentinel-2 data. I will do that. Let me clean up first. Okay, and let's go to Artmo and the machine learning toolbox. So I go again to machine learning. I start from beginning, input, user data. This time we go to uh, Sentinel-2. We again have some uh, field data here. All the credits go to the uh, group of uh, Clement Atzberger because it was data used for the validation of the SNAP neural network um, LAI model. We uh, load it. And in this case, only one variable is available, leaf area index. So we uh, say again, add the dimensions, the units, and uh, we see this has only the, um, oh, my mouse, uh, my computer freezes. Um, <laughs> not sure if you can still hear me, but um, my computer just froze. That would be inconvenient. Guys, are you still uh, following? Maybe give a plus. Um, I just can not do anything anymore. So I guess we will take a break and I will continue afterwards when um, uh, my computer is <laughs> unfrozen and um, then we continue with where we are in three minutes. Is that fine? Please give a plus.